giving a session about Drupal SEO pitfalls and how to avoid them. The session is based about things we encountered on our own websites and also during SEO audits we did. Uh, this will be a duo session with me and Walter who is joining remote. Uh, so, Drupal SEO pitfalls, the Drupal Camp London extended edition. So, about us. Uh, first a bit about me. I'm Vent. I'm a Drupal architect and Drupal trainer at DropSolid. Uh, I was speaker at DrupalCon Amsterdam, uh, Dev Days Lisbon, and DrupalCamp Ghent 2018 as well. So, how about my colleague? Hi everyone, I'm uh, Walter. I hope the audio is coming through uh, quite well and you can hear me. Uh, is that okay, Brent? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'm joining from Belgium. Uh, I didn't make it due to the circumstances, as you can all know. Uh, but I'm an SEO strategist and evangelist also at DropSolid, so I'm calling with Brent. Um, and I like to speak about all things related to SEO. That's why I didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to call in remotely. Yeah. So during the session I will talk about the more dev approach and Walter will talk more about the SEO approach. Uh, maybe to annoy a little bit. Uh, let's do a show of hands. Who here is a developer? Okay, biggest part of the people are developers. Uh, and any SEO specialists or marketing people in here? <laughs> you have one people who's in, who is really busy with SEO, Water. Uh, and the rest site builders or Drupal users, I guess. Okay, so mostly uh, developers, also some site users, and one <coughs> SEO person. Okay, let's get right in. Yeah. Uh, Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, okay, let's dive right in. So the first thing we're going to talk about is public entities. So by default, entities might be publicly available on their own URL. So for example, if you have a team module, uh, then a team member could generate public nodes uh, for each separate team member. So if you have, for example, 20 people in the team, that could uh, result in 20 separate pages uh, for one team member, while they are only really used for the team overview page. So it could result in things you see at the bottom of the slide there, slash node slash 42, or slash taxonomy slash term slash 42. Um, so this generates nodes or pages for each uh, entity separately. So this is actually uh, low value uh, content and thin content pages, and these can be indexed by Google uh, if you're not uh, careful of your setup. So really you don't want these pages on your site because they are a uh, waste of resources. They're a waste of bandwidth, a waste of crawl budgets, and a waste of database storage, among others. So to, to recap, uh, in general, uh, you want your pages on your website to be as valuable as possible, and if you have a lot of these thin content pages, then, well, that's not good for your user experience, and it's not good for Google uh, when it crawls and indexes these low value pages. So the solution to this is actually preventing pages that shouldn't be accessed by accessing them by vis for visitors. Uh, this can be done by modules such as the rabbit hole, ho rabbit hole module. Uh, when, as an example, Walter gave, you have a team page and every team member is a separate node. If the page isn't designed, isn't themed, or isn't meant to be accessed, take away the access to that page and then it will be not indexed by Google as well. 
Next, uh, all pages should always be an entity if that is if that is possible. So oftentimes, pages on your website will be generated based on other content, um, and these will not be an editable node in the backend. So for example, a home, page, a home page is an example of that, or overview pages like we talked about earlier. Um, so when a page isn't editable as a node, there is no easy way to edit the Maple tag information or to configure the XML sitemap inclusion settings for this page. So a content editor should be able to edit the, the meta title or the meta description, things like that. And if a page isn't editable as a node, then the content editor doesn't know how to do that or he isn't able to do that. Uh, there are actually two separate solutions for it. Uh, the first one is to use a Drupal Core Layout Builder. Uh, so with the Core Layout Builder, you can use a page, which is just a node, and add certain blocks to it. So you create your page, add a view to it, uh, and then the end, yeah, end user can just edit the page, add some meta tags, not a problem since all the pages are perfectly doable for SEO, for uh, meta tags. Uh, the other solution, which is the one we use more in Drop Solid, since we are not, well, we'll, we'll hope the ad builder is very good to use in the future, but at the moment, there are some, still some problems with translations or other things. Uh, so for now, we actually use paragraphs uh, for our pages. And we have one paragraph that uses either the block field or the overview field module. Uh, that's a module that allows you to uh, create, a view page, uh, create a view block and use that in a field in a paragraph. So you add your normal basic page, you add the paragraphs to it, and then you can add an overview. An added bonus of this is that the content editor can add blocks below or be, uh, on top or below the overview as well. Uh, so there's two advantages. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about search. Uh, to be more specific, indexable internal search. Now, by default, internal search result pages, or SERPs as Google likes to call them, uh, by default they are often indexable by search engines. Now, again, this results in low value and big content pages, which can be indexed by Google. So we're talking about internal search, so the search functionality on your own website, so not on Google. Uh, so you don't want these low value pages in the index, uh, the same reasons as before. Uh, you want all your pages on your website to be of a high quality, and you don't want low value added content pages to be called by Google. Now, Google even implicitly mentions this in its quality guidelines. Do not let Google bot index internal search results. So if Google tells us to do it, uh, we, we should do it. <laughs> yeah, there are different uh, results. Uh, when you're just using views for search pages, which I, in the previous slides, said don't use few pages, use few blocks, but if you're still using it or it's been used in your website, you can install the meta tags or the meta tags views page uh, and the meta tag views module, and then in your views you can edit the meta tags and check the buttons to prevent search index from indexing this page and present them from following links on this page. Uh, so as you can see, it is possible with a view page to edit the SEO, uh, the meta tags, but it's easier in a separate page. So if you use a separate page, then you just have to install the meta tag, and then it's on the right, same procedure, only a bit easier since it's not a meta tag, and as since it's not in view pages, and when it's in view pages, it's in config, so your content editor can't change it. So this is the advice solution. Just to recap, uh, small, um, if you're not doing this, uh, if you're not uh, blocking Google from indexing those pages, then in theory, your website contains an infinite amount of pages because you can search for anything, um, which will all generate your URL probably. And if you're not blocking Google from indexing it, then your website yeah, contains an infinite amount of indexable pages, which is of course not something, something you want. Okay, uh, continuing uh, on the subject, we'll talk about indexed test environments and pages. Now, development and staging environments are often crawlable and indexable by search engines, sometimes because of configuration issues, 
sometimes because of laziness. We all know how it is. That's not true. Um, <laughs> now, temporary content like your Ipsum text is also something that often shows up in search results. Now, I think everybody can agree that we don't want staging environments or testing pages like paragraph testing pages to be in the Google index or to even be publicly available for that matter. Uh, now, there are a wide range of reasons for this. For example, um, apart from SEO, you don't want people searching for your site ending up on a staging website and uh, ordering something from a staging webshop, for example. Uh, these are all things that can and will happen if you don't look out for them. Now, I added some screenshots here uh, from real websites, real URLs that are in the Google index. So as you can see here, there are some dev and staging environments here. There are some more Gibson text appearing. Uh, on the right-hand side, I see a web shop, uh, it seems. So these are all things to look out for because you don't want people to start shopping on your staging environment, of course. Uh, the solution, uh, there are two solutions. If it's if you have a test page on your live environment, it's more difficult to deny access from it. So the solution again is with the meta tag module. Uh, just check the checkbox prevent search, engi search engines from indexing this page. That's one solution for live environments. Uh, and for staging, you might think the solution is robots.txt, but what we'll cover why it's not uh, the solution later in this presentation. Uh, the best solution is actually preventing uh, access to the page with HTTP passwords. So, uh, if you want to set it up, uh, you can Google it pretty quickly. It's pretty easy to set up, and the client will have to enter a username and a password uh, before they can access the dev or staging environment. Yeah, this will make sure Google can't access the page and can't access it. So, that's what you want. Next up, let's talk about assets being blocked by the robots.txt file. Now, Sometimes, uh, favicles or images or other website assets uh, will be located inside a folder that's blocked for crawlers um, by the robots.txt file. We see a screenshot here at the bottom right. So in this screenshot, for example, at the bottom, we see disallow teams. This means that everything that is in the teams folder uh, will not be accessed by Googlebot or cannot be accessed by Googlebot. Now, in general, we always want Google to view and understand the page just like a regular website visitor would see it. Um, if you are loading assets that you are telling Google you can't crawl these assets or you can't visit these assets, then Google can't really view your website the way uh, a person views it. Um, this could result in some notifications in Google Search Console, as you see on the screenshot on the right here. Uh, notifications saying page partially loaded, so not all page resources could be loaded. This can affect how Google sees and understands your page. So we want Google to be able to understand our page entirely. So we don't want these assets blocked in the robots.txt. Now, you should make sure all your assets, like images, icons, polygons, are in a publicly available folder, so they are not blocked. And you could also keep an eye on our Google Search Console for notifications regarding blocked resources. Okay, next topic, module overload. Uh, so, there are a lot of modules in Drupal, uh, and of course you want to add a lot of them since all the, all the modules add good things, uh, but we have to watch out a bit. Uh, you have to be careful, uh, modules that you implement that have an impact on site loading pages are of course less good. Uh, a module that's just used in backend doesn't really hurt, but a module that loads something when rendering the page Every single thing that uh, has to be rendered while loading the page, of course, slows down your site and slows. Yeah, that's not good for Google. Uh, so we can. So this is a quote from Google. We encourage you to start looking at your site speeds, not only to improve your ranking in search engine, but also to improve everyone's experience on the internet. So it's really important for Google to load your pages very quickly. Uh, what's the solution to it? Actually, it's pretty simple. Just think twice before you install a module. Uh, if it has an impact on page load, and if you really need a module. A uh, classic uh, example of it is the Add to Any module, uh, which adds the share to Facebook uh, links. We actually don't use it. We use a custom solution. Since the custom solution we use is just adding some links, and the Add to Any uh, loads some JavaScript, which is very slow. Uh, well, it's just 
a simple link. So that's something to consider. If you add a module, does it impact the page speed in a positive or negative way? And do I really need it? Okay, let's talk a bit about redirects or chain reactions. So if you don't pay close attention to your redirect setup on your server, this could result in multiple redirects falling off on each other. So these are also called redirect chains. Now, these redirect chains are really not user uh, and search engine friendly because when Googlebot, the crawler from Google, visits a page uh, which returns a redirect status code, so for example a 301 or a 302, then Googlebot will add that next page to the bottom of its to visit list for that website. So Googlebot does not crawl all pages of your entire website every single day. It has a list of pages of your website and it just goes down that list. Now if it stumbles upon a URL that has a 301 redirect and it adds the new URL at the bottom of that list. Now, for small websites, it, it, this isn't really a big problem, but for big websites, this could result in very slow indexation times. Because when Googlebot visits a page and it wants to index it, but it returns a 301, then that new page will be added at the bottom of the list. So this will result in very slow indexation times. This is a, a screenshot of a link redirect trace. Um, now this shows that we visited a page on HTTP and without www dot in front of it. This resulted in a 301 redirect redirecting to the W version, which, it, which then redirected to the HTTPS version with the Ws. So it would be better to combine these two redirects into one, and if you visit the first URL, you are immediately redirected to the last one. So combine redirects wherever that's possible. The solution for this, uh, we all, or most of us, probably have seen these lines in the default HD password of Drupal. Uh, it's fine to just uncomment this for small sites, but if you have bigger sites, it's better to think like, hey, what are the redirects of my site, and change this, oh, that was a bit too quick, to something more like this, like if it's the HTTPS www, then go to that one, if it's that one, go to that one, and if it's another one, go to another one. So just to combine those double redirects to get the middle one out. So that's only one redirect in two, instead of two redirects. Yeah, and the less redirects are the better. Uh, I think Google also said that from, I think, five or six redirect hops, it will start ignoring your URL your entirely. So uh, just try to combine them whenever possible. Uh, let's talk a bit about security leaks that could have a big impact on your SEO. So if you allow public file uploads on your website, for one case, um, this could result in lower organic traffic when it's not set up correctly. So for example, if files can be uploaded without some form of authentication or CAPTCHA, it could result in spammers uh, uploading thousands of files and all these files being indexed by Google. Um, a specific example would be if you uh, allow, uh, if you have jobs on your website and you allow people to submit applications and to upload their resume, this could mean that uh, if this form is not uh, authenticated or has a CAPTCHA, this could mean that spammers could use that form to upload uh, torrents, for example. So that's what you see here. You see a screenshot of a website that contained a lot of torrents that were uploaded, uh, which is of course something you do not want. Um, and it's, it's not only bad for your website, for your server, um, but it's also bad for your SEO. So this is a screenshot from Google Search Console, and this screenshot says, one issue detected, uh, page affected by manual actions, are either demoted in Google Search results or removed entirely. So this means Google noticed there was, there was a spam on this website, and it said, yeah, we're gonna put a manual action on your website, and it could mean your page or your entire website is removed from Google Index, which could have, which could have a huge impact on your business, of course. Uh, now these manual actions, they really are manual, in the case that it is actually a Google employee that is reviewing your website, noticing the spam, and adding the manual action. Uh, this is not something that's automated, um, this is really an employee 
uh, that adds those things. And they're also very hard to get rid of. You can get rid of them, but it's pretty hard. So whatever you can, you do not want manual actions. Um, just a quote from, the, from Google itself. So Google issues a manual action against the site when a human reviewer at Google has determined that pages on the site are not compliant with Google's webmaster quality guidelines. So it's a real, uh, it's a human reviewer, it's a Google employee, and it slaps your site with a manual action. So try to avoid those wherever you can. Yeah. Uh, so this is a really important one. Uh, luckily, there's quite a simple solution. Uh, when you have a form on your website, just add a reCAPTCHA. Uh, there are two modules that I can suggest. Uh, the reCAPTCHA that you probably all know, and the simple reCAPTCHA, which is less known. Uh, I'll quickly go over the advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, so the reCAPTCHA is the widely used one that allows Ajax forms and is fine if it's only one contact page. Uh, but the problem with this one, uh, it's been used quite widely, but it actually disables caching on every page where reCAPTCHA is added. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but if you have, for example, a form that it's on every page, and you add the Google reCAPTCHA module, which everyone uses, then all pages that contain that form will receive, receive the no cache, no cache tag. So that's a pretty big impact on the speed of your website. Uh, because we detected this issue as well, uh, one of our developers created another module, simple reCAPTCHA. Uh, it's less advanced than the reCAPTCHA module. Uh, as said, it doesn't allow Ajax forms, which the reCAPTCHA form, uh, reCAPTCHA module does, but it does allow uh, caching. So if you have a form on every page, then I would advise to look at simple reCAPTCHA so that the caching doesn't get, yeah, uh, no cached. Uh, the other thing, uh, this is more uh, for GDPR and all those things. Uh, is to think if I have an upload form, where should those be put? Uh, should they, those be set in the public files? Or is it possible to put them in the private files? If it's, for example, resume of customers that for job applicants, then you don't want those publicly indexed. For example, in my resume, my name is in there, my address is in there, my telephone number is in there. I would hate it if that gets on Google just by uploading a form on a website. So, when possible, try to use the private files uh, upload, uh, and it's also advised to put those folders outside of your doc route. Uh, this should be common knowledge, but I prefer to say it uh, one time extra. Okay, so now let's talk about the difference uh, between uh, robots.txt and uh, no index. So, contrary to popular belief, blocking a page using the robots.txt or adding a noindex directive to the meta robot stack, they are not the same thing. So robots.txt instructions will impact crawling, not indexing, and a noindex directive, for example by using a meta tag on a page, will impact the indexing of that page but not the crawling of it. So this is a very specific uh, and important difference. So robots.txt is for crawling, noindex is for indexing. Now it sounds pretty weird, but Google is able to stumble up on a link on some external website that's linking to a page which is blocked by robots.txt and Google will still index it. Now this result, the result of this will most likely be a snippet in the search results without a title or a description because Google can't read the title or meta description, but the URL could still be in the index even though it's blocked by robots.txt. Now, I can hear somebody thinking, now, wait a second, I understand it could happen, in theory, that a link is indexed even though it's blocked, but does it really happen in practice? And actually, yes, it does happen in practice in some cases. So, for example, here, uh, we have a screenshot of Drupal.org, which doesn't have a description, it doesn't have a title, it just has a weird-looking URL. Now, if we dig into why this is the case, we found their robots.txt. And if you look there on the screenshot, it says Googlebot picked up some strange homepage URL somewhere. And then they disallowed the entire slash home folder, hoping that those weird URLs would disappear from the index. But of course, like I just said, uh, this only impacts the crawling and not the indexing. 
So Google is still able to index it, and it has indexed it, but it's just not able to crawl it, which is why there's no title or description. So this is not really the, the good way of trying to remove a page from the Google index. Actually, if they would want that page to be removed from the index, then they should remove the entire uh, robots.txt instruction. So this, this slash home should be removed. And they should simply add either uh, a no index directive to that page in the meta tags, or they could just 404 the page. And if a page is 404 uh, or 410, let's say it's called 410, then uh, Google will, will remove it from the index after a while. So if you want pages removed from the index, do not block them using robots.txt. Next up, uh, some Google Analytics horror. Now, of course, correct data in Google Analytics or another analytics tool is very important when, when people are analyzing their SEO efforts. Now, I know this is not something developers usually uh, take a look at, but if you are just launching a site, um, you should, or in a couple of months, you should pay close attention to sudden drops and spikes in Google Analytics data because sometimes there might be a configuration issue and you don't want your customer calling you a couple months later saying there's an issue uh, which you could have prevented. So pay close attention to sudden drops and spikes. For example, this is a screenshot showing the amount of users to a website and we can see that in the beginning of January 2019 that there was a slight or a big increase in the amount of users now, this could be the customer saying, uh, well done, our content uh, efforts, our SEO efforts are finally paying off. But in this case, uh, that really wasn't, wasn't what was happening. So what was happening was that the uh, EU, EU cookie compliance module sorry, was updated. Um, the update of this module resulted in each page view starting a new session as long as website visitors didn't accept the cookies. So for example, if I browsed to the website and I visited 10 pages, then this would result in uh, 10 sessions of one page each instead of one session of 10 pages. So this is really messing with the data. Now there's a couple of possible solutions for this. The first solution is this one. Uh, and this one, to be GDPR compliant, we will anonymize the visitor's IP address now, this will be done either in Google Analytics or Google Tag Manager, depending on what you use for tracking. So the left screenshot is Google Analytics, the one below it is Google Tag Manager, and we will just set the anonymized IP setting to true. This will make sure that the IP addresses, um, the last uh, part of it, are anonymized, so they are not personally identifiable information, which is good for GDPR. Second, uh, in this step of this two-step fix, we will whitelist the Google Analytics cookies uh, in the Drupal module. So there you can see on the right-hand side, we have three whitelisted cookies, and these are the Google Analytics cookies. Now this whole thing combines, make sure that Google Analytics is always executed, but the IP address is anonymized. There's also another possible solution, which uh, Brent will explain. Yeah, the second solution is more the developer's approach. Uh, there's an update or a patch for the Google Analytics module uh, to be compliant with the e to, to be compliant with the EU Google compliance. Uh, it will only start tracking as soon as people have pushed the OK button of the Google Compl compliance module. So this will of course be reduced in your page visits, since I don't know how many percentage of the people really click the button. But as long as they don't click the OK button, they're not being tracked. Uh, so this is a more GDPR compliant solution, but I don't think it's uh, the best for your SEO results. Yeah, of course you want as much data as possible, so anonymizing is often the better solution, but it could depend on your own situation. Now let's take a look at untranslated contents on your website. So if you have a multilingual website, Yes, they should be translated 100% uh, whenever that is possible. Because if content is not translated, Drupal will automatically show content from the default language, which is, which is often English. So this could result in English content being shown on the French section of a website, for example. Now this is not ideal for a couple of reasons. 
uh, for what it could scare away non-English speakers. Um, and it could also uh, confuse Google, because if you have uh, a French page or multilingual site and it has a French section with untranslated content, then it could be the case that your header is in French, your footer is in French, but the content is in English, for example. That could give mixed signals to Google, because Google will think, is this now an English page or is it a French page? And this will have an impact on your SEO rankings. So when possible, you should translate it, of course. So the solution depends, of course, on the situation. Uh, for this, you have to sit together with your clients. First question, of course, can you translate everything? Is that an option? If not, then maybe the solution is to deny access to untranslated pages. Uh, this can be done with a module such as the content language access uh, module. Uh, but preferably, the client translate everything. But when a client is really lazy or it's not possible, then this might be a better solution. Yeah, you could um, to to. Uh talk a bit about more about that first case. Uh, you could also say if we can translate everything, maybe we can add a line of content to that page and say this page is not available in French, but in French and translated, of course, and a link to the English version. So that's an option as well. Maybe that way you can follow up on your Google Analytics and you can see if people visit that page, if people have an interest in it, and if yes, it might be a good idea to uh, translate it. So next up, uh, we will end with a couple of rapid-fire best practices. Uh, so for tracking, you should use the Google Analytics module or the Google Tag Manager module. You should not use both of these modules together. Now, if you do, make, uh, if you do use these modules together, it makes your tracking setup very prone to errors, and we have seen this time and time again uh, that this happens. So, for example, you will see a screenshot here from Google Analytics. Um, and in this case, on the 6th or the 7th of May, uh, the Google Tag Manager module was added to the website. And the Google Analytics tracking was also added to Google Tag Manager. So, uh, basically, this means that the page views, uh, the page view data, is sent twice to Google Analytics. Once because of the Google Analytics module, and once because of the tracking setup within Google Tag Manager. So if a client sees this, um, they might think, oh yes, our pages went up, we did a good job, but actually you're just sending uh, twice the amount of pages to Google that you need to send. So be careful with this and use Google Analytics or Tag Manager, not both. In most cases, uh, Google Tag Manager is the best way to go since you then consolidate all your tracking related information to one module. Uh, the second one, when possible, aggregate and minify your CSS and JavaScript files. Makes your page load faster. Google likes fast websites, so. Yeah, also make sure each page has a correct and well-configured canonical tag. Now, depending on the complexity of your website, you might want to let a, an SEO specialist review all your canonical tags, um, because there can be a lot of small issues depending on your setup. Now, to be honest, even for small websites, I advise you to really take a close look at your chronicles, make sure they are set up correctly, and just let the specialist have a look at it. Um, there are some specific best practices here. You should always use absolute URLs in the canonical tag. Uh, this is something Google actually explicitly said, so you, you should use absolute URLs, not relative ones. You should also make sure that all these canonical tags return status code of 200. Now, you don't want to set a canonical, for example, to a www dot version if that URL automatically redirects to the non-w version. Um, another example is that you have an HTTPS website, but your canonicals are set to the HTTP version, uh, the non-secure version. So these will redirect then to uh, another page, so your canonical Goal will not return 200. So make sure all your canonicals return status code 200. Now, also in most cases, you will want to omit URL parameters from the canonical URL. For example, if you have a web shop uh, with some facet filtering on price or on color or on brand, uh, these facet filters probably modify your URL. 
you don't want these parameter parameters to be added to the canonical URL of that page. Now, there are some exceptions. Let's say you have a webshop, and one of your, your uh, largest products is, for example, white sneakers, and these are webshop facet filters as well, then you might want the, the white sneakers uh, parameters to really be in the canonicals, so Google can index that page separately, since it's an important product category. So there are some exceptions, but in general, you want to omit the URL parameters. And when, when that's the case, also maybe have a look at the fastest pretty parts to not just use query parameters, but really use decent URLs. Uh, the next rapid fire part auto module, everyone should know it, everyone should be using it. So I'm not going to cover it in the detail, uh, but just don't forget to translate them as well. Uh, this is, for example, an example. Uh, it's a Dutch website, and the URL is slash products. Well, in Dutch, I don't know how many people here know Dutch, but it's, it isn't products, but producten. Next up, you should follow up on the amount of pages indexed by Google. This can be done by using Google Search Console. So here you can see in this coverage report that for this specific website, there are 263,000 valid URLs indexed by Google. Now, if this seems a bit high, then there maybe is a rabbit hole setup needed to remove pages from the index. So if we, if we uh, uh, look back at our first or second points, we talked about the team's overview page and every team member being indexable and having its own separate page. Maybe that is the issue here, uh, if your page count seems too high, and maybe you need to adjust your rabbit hole setup. Um, if it seems too low, if, uh, if I go back, if the screenshot shows too few pages in your eyes, then maybe some important pages are no indexed. Maybe there's a default meta tag setting somewhere that no indexes a lot of pages, so you could take a look over there. Um, but really, keep an eye on the count here, on your coverage report, and see how much pages are indexed, and if this sort of less matches what you thought it would be. Okay, uh, the sitemap. Uh, take a look at your sitemap. Uh, it should cover the URL, but a lot of uh, websites we've seen have HTTP defaults in the URL in the sitemap. Uh, this can be to misconfiguration about the sitemap. Uh, some more information can be found on this page, but in the next slide I'm also going to cover the best solutions we found. Uh, so, oh, apparently this slide went through it, so I'll just tell it uh, without showing. Uh, so the first solution, if, you're, if possible, add your base URL to your settings.php, uh, but in some cases that isn't possible. Uh, if that's the case, if it's not possible, oh, there's a slide. Uh, so the other solution is if you're executing cron, don't forget to add URL to your cron. Uh, if you add this, the sitemap will generate without the default. If you forget to do those two things, 95% of the time your sitemap will contain default in URL, which is of course not a good practice. Yeah, that was the screenshot shown here. So if you submit a sitemap to Google, uh, or Google found, finds a sitemap which contains uh, HTTP default, for example, then it will show something like this. So it will show submitted sitemaps, um, submitted URL not found 404. So this is not something you want. This is a screenshot of a Google Search Console, by the way. Next up, you want to create some checklists. So this is common knowledge, I think, but you should uh, keep a checklist handy for things that have to be done before you go live, things uh, you have to check just when the site went live, things to check when the site is live for an amount of days. Um, so for example, the peaks in Google Analytics and things like that, follow that up once every seven days or something in the, in the first days after launch. Um, and we, we go over these checklists um, either in depth or in SEO. Um, these are important things to follow up on because small things could have a big impact in SEO. So follow up on these. Okay, that's a little bit slow. Uh, so make sure you have all the available tools to increase the speed of your website. As said a couple of times, Google takes into account the speed of your website. So default triple caching should be uh, enabled for everyone. Uh, 
keep in mind the simple reCAPTCHA and Google reCAPTCHA. That one breaks all these things. Uh, the other solutions, Varnish, Memcached, or Redis. Uh, if possible for your website, try to install one of multiple of them. And also the advanced aggregation is also a speed boost. But these are, uh, for most sites, the default Drupal caching will be okay. For bigger sites, I highly advise one of the other ones as well. I don't know if there are any questions. Yeah. So, a question. Um, if you use the Path Auto module, um, then this is actually an article here which mentions using the global redirect module. So, um, you know, if you've got the URL, which is like node slash one, two, three, yeah. that'll always just redirect to the alias made by Path Auto because having both present parent effects uh, SEO. Um, I'm not sure I'm following the complete question, but when you set up the path auto, uh, I think it will automatically set the canonicals and uh, yeah, the URL perfectly. So when you go to the correct page, it will show the, the path auto generated page and the canonical it will show the correct one. I don't know, I think it's the, what's the correct one in the canonical? Not the note, but the, the real path, right? Or yeah, the canonical should never contain a node. Yeah, it should contain a real URL. Yeah, when you set up the path auto, it will do it perfectly for you. I don't know if that answers your question or. Um, yeah, it's, it's just around like it mentioned the use of this global redirect module. Um, but yeah, the way just to make sure that both node slash one two three and the path auto URL both get accessed by. Yeah, they should be both accessible, but the node is always accessible and uh, at the path auto will be if you had it co correctly. I don't know if there are other questions. Just to clarify, you're talking about possibility of duplicate content. Mm -hmm. You want just one of the URLs to be. Yeah. Yeah, then the canonical is very important. Uh, that's right, Walter. So to prevent duplicates, uh, pages, the canonical is the most important part. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get the question. To prevent duplicated pages. Yeah. The canonical. Yeah, the canonical, yeah. So duplicate content is when yeah, your website contains a lot of same blocks of text on multiple pages. Um, and if you have a couple of pages which contain exactly the same content, then you can say to Google, hey, look, Google, I, I know I have duplicate pages, but you should only index this one page. And that one page is then the canonical URL. So the canonical URL is an indication for Google to say this is the URL you want to index. Someone else with another question? Yeah. Um, how, how do you suggest handling pages that get, that get removed from the website? If some content is no longer valid in a month or it's just something that's no longer available or something, do you just simply remove from the website and rely on 404 responses, or do you redirect them somewhere else? Uh, well, best practice is to redirect to another one just for usability of a site, but it depends on what kind of page it was, I think. If it's like a page, like I'm going to say opening hours, and you have another page that has the same, then of course you try to redirect. But if it's, yeah, if the shop has been closed down, then you don't really need to redirect or redirect to the home page, maybe. So it kind of depends on what kind of page you're talking about. So try to, yeah. But the default one, uh, is it best to, what can you weigh in? Is it best to? Yeah, maybe I can jump in. Yeah, so if I, if I understand it correctly, because the, the volume was pretty low, uh, you were asking what the, the correct uh, or the best approach is when content is no longer relevant on your website. So either to yes. remove it or to redirect it, right? Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, okay, so that indeed depends on the type of content. Um, say, for example, you have a web shop with a product category that you removed and you decided not to, not, not to sell these products anymore. Then you get them just for, for the page because it's not relevant anymore to rank for it in Google because you don't sell these products anymore. Uh, you don't have another category that looks like it, so you can just fall for it. 
But say, for example, um, you stop selling uh, men's shoes, but you uh, still sell women's shoes, uh, you could redirect all the, the men's shoes URLs to your women's shoes, for example, because it's a relevant page, it has something to do with each other. So if the pages are contextually relevant, you can use redirects, but if not, you can just remove the content. Uh, another example is, is when you, for example, place uh, a news item on your website saying uh, we will be closed uh, during the summer months uh, of 2020. Um, if that page is no longer relevant, but you, you go to the next year for 2021, for example, you could just redirect the old URL to the new URL. So then you don't have to remove your information of your opening hours or, or your vacation time, but you can just redirect to the latest page containing the latest information. So redirect whenever possible and whenever relevant, but if it's content that is really no longer relevant, then you can just fall for the page. Someone else with another question? No, not really. Then everyone, thanks for uh, listening. Uh, if you need, if you have other questions, feel free to contact us. Uh, yeah, you can contact us on LinkedIn or through mail uh, or on Twitter as well. And I'll be around here, uh, but obviously not. Maybe for another year. Uh, <laughs> But everyone, thanks for your uh, attention.